first I went to the Marine recruiting office because um, I thought the Marines were like straight gangster at the time. Like those, those were it. those were the guys I want to be, you know. And um, I, I went into the Marine recruiter, and you know, I showed up in my gang attire. And, you know, I still had the tattoos on my face, and um, and you know, they respectfully told me like, "Hey, we can't, we can't do this," <laughs> you know. Um, and going over to the Navy. Uh, right next door and sure enough I went in there and there was a Hispanic um, recruiter there uh, and uh, he helped me out you know I told him what my story was um, I'm trying to change I want to do for my daughter and my family and he was all right let's give it a shot you know went through the process did the paperwork and uh, made my way up to a fine uh, lady who will actually sign my waiver to join the military uh, due to my gang related tattoos she gave me an opportunity Welcome to the Transition Drill Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Pantiani. I appreciate you taking the time to watch. So let's get into this. How does a Navy Master Chief not live on coffee? You know what? I get that question all the time. And they actually clown me on the ship. Like, how does a Master Chief or any chief in the Navy get by without coffee? And I ask myself the same question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I did it. But um, yeah, I have no idea. Coffee has never been my thing. But you know what? I love me some Starbucks at least once a week. I go okay. and it's, I guess it's not really coffee, a latte. Or a, <laughs> it's not really. You know what I mean? What is it? Vanilla latte <laughs> or a white chocolate mocha? You know, I get clowned uh, about it, but I'm cool with it. I even got some coffee here, but, you know, I don't even use it. It's for my guests. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I asked you this morning, you're like, oh, I'm good. I don't drink coffee that mine. <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, I get it all the time, man. How's the how's retirement treating you? Uh, retirement life is great, man. You know, I feel free for once. You know, I feel like I've been running my whole life. You know, I feel like uh, at an early young age, you know, I've been running and and running, you know, running my, and, and just running uh, in the hood and then joining the military. It's been nonstop, you know. And now that I'm retired, I feel like I stopped running and I'm catching my breath. So it feels good, you know. How many days are you into it now? Uh, so March 31st is when I retired. So a couple months in, do you still find that you're still transition, getting your mind transitioned out of it? Or were you really easy to just switch it off and go, Hey, I'm civilian world. Uh, it was definitely a challenge. You know, that paradigm shift was, was rough. You know, um, I found myself in the shower. I was in the shower in the morning. Like, okay, why am I hurrying up? Why am I in a hurry to take a shower? Like, I don't have nowhere to be. I don't have nothing to do right now. Take your time. So that took a little bit of time, just the little things, you know. Uh, and then and getting out of bed, you know, and being in the Navy for so long, you're, you're up and out. You're, like, you're ready to go. So I found myself jumping out of bed and running into the bathroom. Like, what am I doing? Slow down. So that took a little bit of adjustment, some time to, um, you know, to, to get it, to get into a routine where I was comfortable. So now I'm starting to get there slowly. The sleep part is still it's still a little bit off balance, but I'm getting there, you know. Now, naturally, would you be somebody who could just sleep all day, or or is it the military kind of mess that up by always having to get up early? Yeah, the streets and the military both mess that up. Um, definitely the military because my job consisted of a lot of long days, late nights, little sleep, little food. <laughs> uh, so my body was just used to that for so many years. So trying to adjust to that now, it's it's been rough, but it, it's getting better for sure. You mentioned running. You still are you still running? Yes, I, I run at least. I try to run six days a week. I try to shoot for seven. Uh, normally on the seventh day, I do a long walk along the waterfront. Uh, but for sure, I'm running uh, every day. You got a race in mind coming up? You know what? I I really thought about the marathon in Los Angeles. I always said I wanted to run the Los Angeles marathon. Uh, you know, it's, it's the city where I'm from. You know, and um, I'm really thinking hard about it. It's going to be early next year, scheduled normally about January, February time frame. Uh, so I'm going to give it a go. I think. I think I will. So the the reason why I bring that up is because I think. Well, I, I know our paths crossed, but we had no idea who each other was. Because you last did the San Diego Marathon, the Rock and Roll Marathon, 2019, correct? Yes. Did you do the full or the half? I did the full. Okay, so I did the half. So at some point in time before the turnaround, I'm wondering if we crossed paths and just didn't even know. I'm sure we did, man. It's a small world, right? Wow. That's cool. 
So let's start going backwards now before we keep going forward. Tell me about where you grew up. So I grew up in Los Angeles, California. Um, lived in several cities uh, throughout my time, but um, yeah, Los Angeles, Southern California. I grew up in a single family household uh, with my mother, my father, my sister. And we, uh, like I said, we lived in several cities. We lived in Gardena, Long Beach, Los Angeles. Uh, and you know, what's funny too is one of my friends, uh, my best friend actually reminded me that I was homeless at, at one time. Him and I both, you know, because I was living with him for a little while when I wasn't home with my mother. And uh, he actually got kicked out of his house, which meant I was kicked out as well. <laughs> and you know, we were like, I don't want to leave you. Yeah. Check him out. Yeah, and uh, we were living in the hood for a little while, for a few weeks. He's like, man, you remember that? And I was like, no, you just reminded me of that. So, yeah, I lived, I lived in the hood as well, um, in South Central Los Angeles, Florence area, Florence area and uh, Huntington Park as well. So, you mentioned mom and dad. So, mom and dad together, divorced? Yeah, so mother and father were together until I was the age of five. Five years old is when they got divorced. Uh, and my father left and didn't come back into my life until I was about 10, 10, 11 years old. We, as a kid, what were you thinking? What, what took up your daily life? Were you good at school? Were you into sports? Yeah, so as a kid, um, uh, I can go back to kindergarten days. So kindergarten days, by that time, my father was already out of my life. And uh, my mother was working, trying to maintain the household, take care of my sister and I. And uh, so I jumped into kindergarten, and that's when I learned English because I didn't I didn't know English at the time. Um, so I found that I was very good at um, well, math, and then very good at picking up English like pretty quick. And some other things helped me as well, like TV or whatnot. But um, when I got into elementary school, I was like one of the fastest runners in that school. I remember clearly uh, how I don't know. <laughs> uh, I remember that small little racetrack in elementary school. And uh, we would race, I was in first grade, and we would race against the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders, and I would smoke them. Like, man, you know. As a first grader. As a first grader. <laughs> you know, I was this little skinny Mexican kid, you know, and I was just, I was run, I was a runner. I don't know where I got it from. My mother wasn't a runner or my father. Uh, but yeah, I was a good runner. Uh, but other than that, I didn't get into any other activities. Were, are, so are you first generation here? Yes. So your mom and dad were born in Mexico? They were born in Mexico, yes. Um, as far as for your... Before you got into the game life, we're going to get to that. What were you kind of thinking might be your adult, or, or were you thinking that far ahead as a, as a young kid? As a young kid, I wasn't thinking that far ahead. I didn't start thinking far ahead until after the game life, actually. Um, but at that age, no. Um, but uh, I did get into skateboarding for a little while. And I was like, you know what? I want to be a professional skateboarder <laughs> one day. You know, I, th- I loved it. I loved skateboarding. Uh, you know, and just getting lost in the city and just going, you know, me and a couple friends. And I thought to myself, you know what, I want to be a professional skateboarder. And I had no idea what all that entailed, what money was going to come or nothing. I was like, I do this for a living all day, you know, but uh, that didn't work out. So we're going to eventually talk about your book, but that leads me to a question I have. Because you talk about in your book, there was a day that you rode to your friend's house and you skipped, they were three hours away. Did you seriously skateboard three hours to go see your buddies? Like, it was me. I kind of took a couple of detours, you know, <laughs> okay. and okay. I was just slow riding. So it was, you know, I made it three hours. <laughs> okay. It really wasn't a three hour, you know, one shot deal. I was, you know, I detoured a little Because I was going to give you major props yeah. for like skateboarding for three hours. No, I definitely detoured, made a pit stop here and there, you know, hit the park a little bit. But yeah, that was a, that was a long ride, man. And, um, I'll never forget that day, actually, because Larry and Eddie, those are the two guys, the brothers, and I'll never forget those guys, man. They, they actually took me in like a, like a brother, you know? Um, uh, you know, I grew up kind of poor, so I, we couldn't afford a skateboard. They handed me one of their skateboards, very popular one, kind of expensive back in the day. I think they still are. I was going to say, you wish you still had it today? Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I uh, remember that day clearly, I skateboarded down there, and, and uh, I remember knocking on their door, and... Yeah, there was no one there, man, and, and that was it. After that, I didn't I didn't see them, I didn't hear from them again, and I was a rat, you know. And and I was going to comment on that is that it's it's sad that you found something that you really enjoyed, but that one experience of skateboarding for three hours, whatever, when you <laughs> knocked on the door and they weren't there, that also closed the door on you skateboarding. Yes, yes, and then drew my attention somewhere else for sure. 
So let's talk about that. The gang life is right outside your front door. Oh yeah, it's right outside the front door. And then uh, once I was done skateboarding, that uh, in elementary school, the gang started becoming more. You know, uh, they were becoming active. You know, you would see them everywhere. They started dressing like kids, the young kids. You know, um, you know the, the baggy clothing. You know, all of the, the haircuts. You know, the, the nets on their hair. All, all of the above. And then um, I started seeing that in school a lot, outside the front door, in the neighborhood, and I was like, man, that's pretty cool. Like, it kind of drew my attention, you know? It drew my attention when I was first young, right outside of my uh, my apartment building, but even as it continued in elementary school, I was like, man, I really want to be a part of that. You know, I want to be part of the cool crowd. Was it always there, but you were involved with other stuff, so you didn't really pay attention to it, or did it get bigger as you got older? Yes, I think it um, it got bigger as I got older, but it, it's been, it was always there, but the skateboard life definitely drew me away from that, drew my attention away from that, for sure. Uh, like I said, I was hoping to do that forever, you know, because I wanted to. So how old were you when you officially got into the game like that? So officially, I would say between 10 and 11 years old, and that was it. I was official. I had the gang tattoos at that age. Uh, and, and it became official once once I did that, for sure. And what year are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about uh, 89, 90. And so, at this point, are you already kind of checked out as far as school? Or are you still trying to balance? Are you trying to be a gangster and still do well in school? Yeah, so at this point, um, I, was, I was kicked out. Of, so, the last grade in school I attended was seventh grade. So I was kicked out of that school in seventh grade for getting into a fight with a gang member. I got kicked out of that school and I was trying to enlist in other schools and they weren't having me because I've already got kicked out of other schools previous to that. And um, so I found an alternative program out of Los Angeles County. And I, I was actually referred to that program and then they took me in. So while I was still active in the hood, I was actually attending that alternative program. Um, you know, my mother always put that kind of that seed in, in my head, like, hey, you need to stay in school. She always, you know, that's one thing I'll give her, I'll give her a lot of things, but that's one thing that she really pushed is education, education, stay in school, do well in school. You need that diploma. And luckily that program, even though it was like, hey, you show up once a week and you turn in your school packet, I was still able to achieve a high school diploma out of that program, which was great. Um, so I stayed the course, man. You know, I was I was an active gang member in the hood. <laughs> I got to do my homework, guys. Yeah. Because in my mind also, I was like, you know what? It's going to pay off some way, somehow. You know, and stay in school and do what I can. You know, I have to ask of most of the work. Um, I'm going to be straight up. Um, but then the teacher would put me back on course. And she's like, hey, you need, to do, you need to give more effort. I need more from you. And this is why. And she kept me in line as well. Her name was Mrs. G. I'll never forget her either. Uh, that's what I called her, Mrs. G. Uh, she had this very long last name. I won't say it, but um, I would call her Mrs. G. And she, she was cool with that. But she helped me along the way as well. She pushed me. And it was a struggle. I remember it was a struggle to get to that school where I would have to turn in my packet uh, once a week. So I would take a bus. Sometimes I didn't have money for the bus. So I'd have to walk. And I was always in, in some kind of problem. They were looking for me or I was fighting or, or something always happened. And it was like on site every time, you know, transiting to the school and back. So. And I, I think for a lot of people who go down those, let's call it the bad path, the ones that are able to pull themselves out, there's something internal in them that just kind of keeps them, I guess, centered as best as possible. But looking back at that time, was it easy to, to pull away and get your schoolwork done or were your friends giving you a hard time over it or, or did they kind of see like, hey, let's just leave them alone? You know what? I never told anyone. Even, I don't even think my best friend knew I was enrolled in school. Uh, so I kind of kept to myself when it came to the school thing. I, I didn't tell anyone. The only one that really knew was my, my mother. And I don't even, I'm not even sure that my sister knew. Oh, wow. <laughs> but um, yeah, I kind of kept to myself on that. And I just, like I said, I stayed the course and I felt I remember feeling like there was something, something good was going to come of it. What about your sister? Did she was she dialed into school, or did she go down the negative path also? Yeah, my my sister didn't dial into school either. She didn't do well and, and got involved in gangs herself. Um, a smaller gang, but active gang um, out of the city of Bellflower, and uh, she didn't stay the course in school. So um, she ended up having a, a baby boy, and, and that was her focus. Now, you mentioned your mom kind of drilled into you, hey, school's important. 
but and, and not, I'm not trying to say either one of your parents did something wrong, but were either one of them like, hey, pull your head out of your you know what and stop this gang life? Or yes, so uh, so my mom, oh yeah, my mom would give me, she would give me the business every day about it. I mean, the way I dressed, the way I carried myself, and oh my, when I got those tattoos, <laughs> the world was upside down. You know, like well, you were 18 when you got those tattoos, uh, right? Actually, yeah, I was 11 <laughs> years old when I got those tattoos. You know, and she just. I'll never forget the day that she discovered those tattoos on me, you know, as a kid. I, you know, my kid, my son is 13 years old now. And I look at him, I'm like, oh my gosh, at his age, I already had tattoos on my face. Like, I couldn't imagine, you know, if someone tattooed my son's face, I'll go track it down. <laughs> I want to know who did that, you know. Um, but yeah, my mom gave me business. She gave me the business about it all the time. I mean, she screamed and yelled and cried, all of the above. No, uh, but it went in one year and came out the other. You know, I wasn't listening. Now, when you were a little guy and started hanging out with the actual gangsters, and and I know especially in the Latino culture, the veteranos, was there nobody who kind of went, "Hey, little man, I, I get it. You want to you want to hang with us. You want to kick it, but don't go down that path." You know what? Sadly, I can't remember one person, not one person that told me that. Um, in fact, it was the opposite. Like they were encouraging me to take care of business, you know. And being that I was at a young age, you know, hey, you oh, you won't get as much time as, as the older guy, you know, not one. Yeah. So pretty much throwing them under the bus, they were looking at you as a worker. They're like, hey, this little dude will do whatever we say, and it it prevents us from going to jail if he gets caught. I would say for some of them, not all. Um, I was, there was there was a handful that were all about that. Yes. Hey, as long as he takes care of business, you know, who cares? <laughs> so other than your mom, there was really no voice in your head saying, hey, this life ain't for you. Other than my mom, no. I can't think of any. I'm, there was a couple, you know, uh, school teachers or whatnot. But other than that, no, no one. My, like I said, my father wasn't in my life at that time. Uh, again, he wasn't. He didn't come back into my life until I was already deep into the game. You know, so I didn't have anyone. Not wanting to take... People, I want people to read your book, but a story that, that I want to talk about, get your impression of it. So I, I made the comment before that at the end of the day, you've got a compass inside you that kept you closer to the good path than completely going off the rails. But you talk about a couple instances where you had a gun in your hand. And if it wasn't for, and whether you want to call it the grace of God, a, a guardian angel, whatever, it never ended up you pulling the trigger on somebody. Do you look back on that and think, obviously, wow, but what do you think at that time? Do you think you had somebody looking over your shoulder? Uh, me personally, yes. Um, I'll, I'll never sit here and say that I read a Bible, that I've been to church every day, but I'm a big, big believer that, that, that a higher power of God. I believe that without God, I wouldn't be here today. I pray every day to God, and every time that I pray, I know God has my back and he's taken me out of situations like, oh my gosh, like I, can, I can't even believe myself. And um, I've had conversations with God myself. So I've always, I've always prayed to God and that's another thing that my mother is still doing. And later on, my father as well, even he, even though he was gone from the majority of my life, he came back and they both was prayed, prayed to God, prayed to have faith in God. And I, I truly believe 110% uh, that God saved me. Uh, so much so that I, that's my next tattoo. I'm actually going to get a, a tattoo that's going to say God's plan because I believe that God had a plan for me. I feel like God put me on this earth to struggle a little bit, make it through that struggle, right? And then succeed in my career and then to pay it forward. And that's what I want to do now. Do you remember at that time, did you actually have the ability to kind of take a step back? The one story that's sticking out of my head is they, they give you the gun and one of the older guys came up to the car and said, uh, Give me that gun back. And, and maybe they thought that you wouldn't be able to go through it, but the guy that you were sitting in the car with was scared shitless. Yes. Um, did you did you think at that time, like, whew, I dodged a bullet, no pun intended, or do you, were you kind of like pissed, like, man, I could have done it? Yeah, and that and that time my mentality was completely different. I was all about the gang. I was I was down for the hood, and I was willing to do whatever whatever I needed to do to take care of business. So my mentality was like, man, that was a missed opportunity. That's, that's, that was my mindset then, you know? So, going forward, when did you when did you start seeing your mind change in that, okay, I need to do something to get out of this life? Was there one significant event that kind of did it for you? 
I think there was there were so many events that did it for me. Um, but the the main ones were seeing the homeboys getting shot, paralyzed, you know. Um, and I mean, these are homeboys that I'm talking about good people. Like they're good people because they have good hearts. They're just a product of their environment. You know, getting shot, getting paralyzed, going to jail for the rest of their lives, uh, getting strung out on drugs. Um, you know, all, all the bad things. I was just like, you know, I, over time I was like, man. And then the fact that I had to look over my shoulder, like 24 seven, everywhere I went, it, I was looking over my shoulder. You get tired after a few years of doing that, you know? And I was like, you know, something's gotta change. Something's gotta get. You were able to actually stay away from the drugs though. Yes, me personally, yes, but I was uh, I was part of the problem because I was actually involved in, in supplying that merchandise, you know, and the same merchandise that destroyed my homeboys in the neighborhood. So I see that I was part of the problem, you know, and, and I'm embarrassed of that, but it's the truth, you know. But yes, thankfully, no, I was always a drinker. I wanted to drink, you know, I was a liquid guy, even my liquid, you know. So how did the military come to your radar? Yeah, um, so... It was about the same time when, so my daughter was born and, um, you know, I, I said to myself, I got to do something. Going back to what we were just talking about, I got to do something for myself, I got to do something for my daughter. And uh, I remember seeing a commercial one time and uh, it was a pretty cool commercial. It was like a military guy with a gun. I didn't know anything about the military. I mean, I didn't know a squat about the military, I mean, until I joined the military. And I was like, man, that's cool, man. It looks like uh, something I'd like to do, you know, let's go shoot some bad guys, you know, <laughs> at the moment. That's what I thought. And uh, that's when I went to the military recruiting office. How did you settle on the Navy? Well, let me go real quick. Yeah. How old were you when you had first kid? So I was 16 years old when my daughter was born. And um, uh, yes, I was 16. No, I'm sorry. Yes, she was. I was 16 years old. No, oh my gosh. I was 18 years old when my daughter was born. Okay. But yes. so bottom line is when you ultimately went in the military, you were already a father. Yes, I was already a father. My daughter was two years old at the time when I joined the military. Now, I'm assuming when you went to the recruiting office, it was one of the typical strip malls where every branch was in one office or at least right next door to each other. Yes. How'd you end up in the Navy? Yeah, so first I went to the Marine recruiting office because um, I thought the Marines were like straight gangster at the time. Like, those, those, are, those are the guys I want to be, you know? And um, I, I went into the Marine recruiter and you know, I showed up in my gang attire, you know, I still had the tattoos on my face and, um, and you know, they respectfully told me like, Hey, we can't, we can't do this, <laughs> you know, um, and going over to the Navy, uh, right next door. And sure enough, I went in there and there was a Hispanic, um, recruiter there. Uh, and, uh, he helped me out. You know, I told him what my story was, I told him I'm trying to change. I want to do for my daughter and my family. And he was all right, let's give it a shot. I went through the process, did the paperwork, and uh, made my way up to a fine uh, lady who, who actually signed my waiver to join the military uh, due to my gang-related tattoos. She gave me an opportunity. There was never a point where they actually told you, hey, at least take them off your face? Um, so the thing was, on my sideburns, so if my hair grew out a little bit, it could kind of cover them up a little Oh, so they went right along your sideburn? Yes, line. they went right along my sideburn line. So if my hair grew out a little bit, because, you know, I went in there with a buzz cut. I had the, the S.A. Bugs buzz <laughs> cut. So she says, grow your hair out, and that way, um, you know, you won't, it won't be so noticeable. But you can see it better be <laughs> noticeable. But, um, and that was enough for them. You know, that was enough for the Navy. And I'm like, well, that was an opportunity right there. And I'm more than grateful. So what year did you head off to boot camp? So I headed off to boot camp in 1998. And when you got there, what was the transition like for you from basically going living on the streets to all of a sudden, there are some guys in your face yelping 24 seven. Yes. Yes. Uh, tra that transition was tough. You know, going back to the paradigm shift that it was, it was crazy, man. I, I wasn't used to anyone, anyone getting that close into my face, uh, without you know, me bowing up or getting ready to ball up my fist or, or go punch at them or, or whatever the case be or be ready to defend myself. So they were in my face screaming and yelling. I did what I could to, to maintain that discipline. Right? And I thought about my motivation and my motivation with my daughter at the time. I was like, hey, if I say something dumb or, or if I get out of line or if I, you know, even think about touching them, then I'm done. And there goes my opportunity. I'll be right back into the, doing the same old thing on the same old block on the same old tree, you know? 
Was there ever a point though during boot camp where you're like, I made the wrong decision? Um, I think the first week, I, <laughs> I, I kind of I felt that way, man. I was like, man, what did I do? Why am I here? Uh, the first week, I was I was fed up, man, and, and I also got hurt right away too. Um, you know, I wasn't used to running around <laughs> on the base or you know doing all that exercise that they had me do. Um, so I hurt my foot pretty bad, and you know I didn't want to say anything because I knew that that would delay me and delay my process and complete boot camp. Um, but that that pain was. was yeah, that bothered me a lot. And then everything else, you know, I just, I was totally out of my, my comfort zone. So, but, you know, I, I stuck through it again. My whole, I went back to my motivation and helped me get through it. What year, so, oh, no, what year? You went to Great Lakes, correct? Great Lakes, yes. What time of the year? Oh, it was a summertime. So, oh. oh, that weather. Oh, that humid, that humid hot. Oh, my gosh. That was no joke, man. That didn't help at all. Well, I was going to say, could you imagine if you had gone in like December, January, a little a kid from Southern California going to that? Yeah, that would have been even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So going in, were you thinking like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a career out of this? So going in, no. I didn't think I was going to do a career out of this. So uh, I remember the first four years. I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm thinking early in my first four years, I was like, first of all, I was like, I don't want to do this. Why am I here? So the shipyard was actually in the shipyard environment. They were doing a major overhaul on the ship. So we we're doing a lot of rehabbing on the ship, a lot of, you know, cleaning. And I was like, man, this where's is, the guns? Yeah, where's the killing the exactly. bad guys? Exactly. It's like, this is not what I signed up for. Uh, but the leadership did a great thing and they started sending us uh, out to other ships to get the training, you know, to go out to sea. And, and be operational to see what we actually do um, once our ship got operational. And it was great. You know, I was like, I was loving it, man. Up on that flight deck, you know, launching and recovering aircraft and doing the maintenance and the camaraderie with the guys. I was loving it. I was like, oh, hell yeah. And then I was blessed to be able to promote in those first four years pretty, pretty fast. And, uh, and then I was like, oh, man, there's no turning back now. I'm like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Uh, and not until I made uh, E6 is when I said, okay, now I want to make this a career. And that was about, um, I was probably six, seven years into the Navy. Was that two enlistments or one? Uh, that was on, I made E6 on my second enlistment, yes. Oops, take a step back real quick. When you made the decision to go in the military and you told your family and more importantly, your gang friends, did you get support or were you like? So I, I got from my, my, my homeboys, my gang homeboys. So I got, you know, there was good support and some, no support at all and a couple of haters here and there, uh, but I didn't let it bother me and, and no one like nailed me to the floor and said, you ain't going, you know. Um, and my family, you know, some of them were doubting, you know, they're like, ah, it's going to be too tough for you, who can, this and that. Uh, and my ex-wife at the time was kind of neutral. She, she just was like, hey, we don't want, I want you to go away, you know, from your daughter or whatnot. And then my best friend of all didn't want me to go, you know, him and I were you know, I'm tied to the hip and the hood, and uh, but he, he was happy for me. And uh, yeah, so it was a lot of mixed feelings, a lot of mixed emotions for, for both both sides. From a family perspective, how long after you went in did you and your, your daughter's mom separate? Yeah, so um, I think we were we separated when I was on my my second shore duty. So that was uh, that was probably on my third. That was on my third enlistment. And the reason why I ask this is because one of the things I talk about with a lot of the military members is the difficulty in balancing a career in the military and the repeated deployments and away from your family and, and trying to strike that balance. Was her issue the fact that you were just gone or the fact that she potentially was going to have to move from where it was comfortable for her? I think all of the above. One of the biggest things is I was gone a lot. So, you know, my job, my specific job requires me to be at sea a lot. We were operational at sea on aircraft carriers, so we were gone a lot, and that definitely didn't help the situation. You know, uh, I literally took my ex-wife, she's from Los Angeles as well, and my daughter uh, out of California. They never even left California ever in her life, and I moved them to Virginia, you know, all the way across the country. That's the farthest east. I mean, I mean, Illinois, Chicago was the farthest east I've ever been. But yet I flew them all the way to Virginia, which was my first duty station, and that was rough. Uh, in itself, just that move alone, uh, you know, and then going away all the time. Uh, me personally, I think that going away and not being there um, definitely contributed to us not being together. Because that's got to be hard to take somebody 
your wife, yes. uprooted her from California, because I'm assuming she had nobody in Virginia. Nobody. And so, and now she's basically stuck literally in a figurative island by herself, yes. taking care of her daughter. Yes, yes. She did find a friend out there, but I mean, yeah, she really didn't have any support out there. And I, yeah, I felt terrible. And I felt terrible going away. My first appointment was like right off the bat. And I felt bad. I felt terrible. And the things just started downsliding from there, man. It just, you know, kept going away. And just things we started getting more and more distant. You know, I mean, yeah. With you being an active gang member before you came in, and like talk about the face tattoos, or we'll get to you finally removing them down the road. But did having the tattoos and having that prior gang life cause you any problems in the military? Oh, you know what? I did have a run in um, when I first on my first deployment. Yeah, so there was um, a gang member out of Texas uh, that I ran into on the ship on the mess decks where we eat. Um, so I remember it was myself and my, my mentee, uh, George Fierro, just my mentee, and uh, we were walking through the domestics, and there was a crowd of them, him and his friends, the other guy from Texas, and uh, by the way, he started staring us down, you know, and I already knew what that stare down was. I recognized Been there, done that. Yeah, been there, done that. You know, I, we call that, that was mad dogging. You know, so he was mad dogging us, and maybe me. And um, as we passed, and I got my tray, and then next to you know, he's up in my face asking me, where am I from? Which means, what gang are you from? You know, and, and the gangster came out of me, right? Like, I didn't think maybe, I didn't think they'd keep it professional. It just came out of me because it just, he was right in my face. He asked me where I was from, he asked me where I was from. And um, throughout that deployment, you know, we were, we were pushing on each other. We had a little scuffle here and there, but, um, and then he started getting into it with my mentee, George Fierros as well, and a couple other friends, but it wasn't, it wasn't no big thing. We got past it, so. Other than that, no other issues. Other than that, no other issues. Thank you. Do you see that, though, in, in the military quite a bit with the, the guys who can't leave the game life behind? I, I've seen that in the mentality of a couple of young, uh, young sailors in the Navy, um, you know, just joining. But no, none of the senior personnel, for sure. But, uh, you know, s- sailors that are coming from these inner city school or inner city uh, neighborhoods in their states and coming and joining the Navy. Um, a lot of them, it's hard to get rid of that mentality, you know. Um, the, you know, they, they can't find a discipline, and they, they can't see the big picture, and, and that's where we come in. You know, the mentors come in and, and help them see that big picture. You know, I mean, you're not from the hood. You're not in the hood anymore. You're on a Navy warship. So this is our gang. Yeah, this is our gang. It's bigger and better, by the way. <laughs> and and you hit the two key words that I, that I was wanting to follow up with is discipline and mentors. Did, how quickly did you develop a mentor or, or get a mentor? But more importantly, taking that one incident in your first enlistment, where do you think the discipline came from for you to realize what was going on, but not engage it and actually kind of step back from it as much as you could? Oh, yes. That's a great question. Uh, I, I'm thinking about my first mentor. He was a Navy chief at the time. Um, so I was still on that first appointment and I got an email late in that appointment where like, Hey man, we got a new chief in town. He's a new chief. He's a new arresting your chief, and he doesn't play. I was like, all right, cool, let's do it. I'm all about it. I'm, I'm excited to get back. And I uh, remember I got back home from deployment, and um, I was to meet him. I remember something to the effect that I was to meet him right outside the gate, and meet chief, and meet the LPO, the leading petty officer, and the leading supervisor. And uh, for some reason, chief wasn't there. But anyhow, I made my way onto the ship, and I got the worst. Um, ass chewing <laughs> and the first one that I could ever remember and I took it you know hopefully not the last one though. <laughs> and, yeah right um, but uh, Chief Chino he ripped into me and um, it was over something something minor that I did I don't recall um, but as I saw how Chief Chino at the time he's a retired master chief now uh, how he operated how he was respected how knowledgeable he was how he carried himself how he took care of the sailors how he cared about the sailors I was like man this is the man I want to be right here. And um, I stuck to his hit, man. I, I would pick his brain. Uh, you know, I wanted all the knowledge that he had. I wanted all the leadership traits, everything he had, I wanted. And I would, I would bug him, man. And I know I, you know, I annoyed him sometimes, but, but I know he, you know, he trained me out of his heart. Uh, he's good art, not just me, he trained everybody. You know, and, uh, that's what I admired about him. You know, I would be like him one day. I did, thank goodness. And how many years in are you at this point in this? Uh, this was my first enlistment, so it was just under four years. So, 
Yes. But you were already removed enough from the gang life to see the bigger picture and how he wasn't picking on you. He wasn't, it, he was actually trying to help you. Yes. Do you, looking back on it, what was, well, if you could give advice to somebody, was there something that helped you change and see that there's a greater or bigger good to all this and, and kind of let go of that gang mentality that you're not going to F with me mentality? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I, I would, I thought about the end game. So I thought about the end game in the hood. So what's the end game in the hood? The end game in the hood is either you're going to die, you're going to get strung out on drugs or both, or go to jail for the rest of, the, of your life. You know, something, those things are going to happen. You may not be as lucky as me. I was thinking in my mind, you may not be as lucky. If I had a dollar for every, every, every time that I was saved or something, I got myself out of some hot mess, I'd be a millionaire right now. But I thought about the end game in the hood. And then I thought about the end game in the Navy. I was like, the end game is, you know what? I'm successful in the Navy. I make it to the top of the enlisted ranks. I have a retire and I have a pension and full benefits for my children, myself. And, and that's that. And, you know, the better deal was the end game in the Navy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that definitely helped. Looking at the bigger picture, you know, and uh, uh, Chief Chingo at the time definitely helped paint that bigger picture. And at the end of your, or in during your second enlistment is when your mindset switched and you're like, I'm making a career out of this. I'm becoming a lifer. Yes. I don't want to underplay this, but getting to the rank of Master Chief is an amazing accomplishment in the Navy. When did it change for you of not only am I going to do a career, that's my goal. Oh yes. Um, as soon for me, as soon as I made chief, um, and that was um, my yeah, this that was my third enlistment. My third enlistment. As soon as I made chief, it was just under ten years I made chief. And when I made chief, that was one of the greatest moments of my career of my life. Actually, it is ten years on the fast track for making chief. For making chief, ten years is on the fast track. Um, so I was looked at twice before I made a sign. I was looked at by the selection board. Uh, the first time I wasn't selected, and the second time I was, I was selected, I was looked at and I was selected. So just under 10 years is fast track for my specific job, yes. Um, and at that time when I made chief, uh, like I said, it was one of the best um, milestones, one of the best moments, feelings in my career and in my life, uh, that period. And when I made chief, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to make it to the top. I'm going to make it to the top and I want to make it to the top because I, I saw what the Chiefs, how much impact the Chiefs, not just the CM Chiefs and, and the Chiefs, but what the Masters, the impact that the Masters could have on our Navy in a positive way, on our Saviors, on our programs, on our policies, so on and so forth. And I wanted, I wanted to have impact. I wanted to give back. You know, I've taken so much from our world, from our society back in the days. I'm like, man, I want to give back. I want to have an impact, a positive impact. And what better way in the Navy to have a positive impact? highest and this is like, you know, as a master chief, and, uh, sure enough, it worked out, you know, then goodness. Now, in, in your book, you actually went for command master chief. Uh, and, yes. And got denied. How much did that impact you? Um, well, I really didn't, um, my, I, I, could, I wouldn't say I was denied. So I did have the, um, what we call, it's called the PQS, it's a uh, personal qualification standards. It's just kind of like a little requirement, a book you have to get signatures on for and so forth. And, um, so I got to that point. I also got to the point where I, I actually submitted a request to jump into the program. So all that was said and done, ready to go. And all I needed to do is get more training, more signatures, and sit in front of a command master board eventually, and then get selected down the line, hopefully. Um, but I didn't get uh, that that was that opportunity was taken away from me uh, because of something that happened on the ship, and that really that really bothered me. It really did. It bothered me uh, because I felt like um, I had a great opportunity based on my experience as a master chief, based on my my background, based on the fact that I was uh, served in that position as an acting command master chief. So I proved that I can do the job. I felt like I had a great shot in the program. So when that happened, when that opportunity was taken from me, it really, it really put me down in the dumps about that program. And you know what? I said, you know what? Okay, I'm a big believer that everything in life happens for a reason. You know, I know a lot of people think that's corny, but I really believe that everything in life happens for a reason. Uh, 
everyone has a path. Sometimes you gotta follow the course. And that's what I did. I said, you know what? It's not meant to be, I don't think. So you know what? I'm gonna stay the course in the aviation boss's main community, which was my job, my primary community, and I'm gonna make an impact there. And and I stuck to it and that and that's how it went down. How important was it for you during your career to be that mentor? Oh my I can't even describe it in words. I, I love being a mentor. I love giving back. I love the feeling when I provide that personal, professional guidance to that young sailor, or even to my peers, even to my senior personnel. Uh, and I get that, hey, oh, or hey, Master Chief, hey, thank you. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate that guidance or that, you know, all that help or the assistance or uh, everything you said or done to help me uh, become a better sailor or officer or chief or whatever. I love it. And it's really, it's a, it's very rewarding uh, to see results when you're mentoring your sailors or your, uh, like I said, seniors as well. 24 total years. Yes. What was the decision to not keep going? Is there a benefit to going to 30 years in the Navy? Oh, yes. Let me take a deep breath before I get into this. <laughs> oh, my. Thanks for asking that. So, yes, there is a, a, a benefit if you, um, in my case, as an enlisted um E9, a master chief in the Navy, if you do 30 years, uh, one of the benefits is 75% of your pension, uh, which is which is awesome, right? Well deserving for anyone who does 30 plus years in the military. Uh, so that was definitely one uh, one, of, um, one good thing there. Um, but my, I always thought I was going to do 30 years. I always wanted to do 30 years. Once I made master chief, I said, I'm going to do 30 years and I'm going to retire after 30 years. And, you know, see where life takes me. So, so during that second enlistment, when your mind changed and you're going to become a lifer, you, in your mind, you were doing 30 years. In my mind, I was going to do 30 years, yes. Um, so what happened was, um, so I was on my last deployment, which was uh, last year in 2021. It was a COVID deployment, one of the most difficult deployments in my career um, for many reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is anxiety was at an all-time high. So I was on my third shift. I was serving on my third shift back-to-back. And your anxiety or the anxiety of all the sailors? Everyone and mine included. Okay. Yes, everyone and mine included. And one of the anxieties uh, that was eating at me was, where am I going next? I want to be close to my kid. My son, and he's 13 years old. He's at a critical age right now. I don't want to leave California anymore. My daughter's 25 now. You know, I want to be close to her. She, you know, she needs me. I've been gone from my kids for so long. So I'm on my third shift after that. I'm like, okay, I'm hoping that I can stay in San And I understand the needs of the Navy. I understand that what I signed up for. I understand all that. Um, but anyhow, uh, the ship, uh, the career counselors were reaching out to the detailers. Uh, for those non-military folks, detailers are the personnel who, who say, all right, hey, this is where you're going to go. Uh, they're going to list the, the duty stations that are available, and then the detailers are going to tell you, all right, here are your orders. This is where you're going. When uh, the commanders reaching out, the rear councils were reaching out to the detailers. And uh, so it was, they were just putting, putting it out there, hey, if you can do anything to help out Master Brahma, uh, if there's anything available, please sign them up. And this was early before my opportunity window. So we had an, opp- had an opportunity window where you have three opportunities to select the next duty station. And it's, that's not guaranteed. That's just you know, where you would like to go. Uh, and those opportunities came, the first opportunity came, and uh, the only opportunities for me were Virginia, the state of Virginia, the state of Florida, and the state of Washington. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, here we go. Because uh, I already knew it was slim pickings for a mass chief. Uh, you know, the higher up in rank you move, the, the pool becomes a lot smaller on where you want to go or where they're going to send you. And I was like, okay, uh, nothing. First look, nothing. I made contact with the detailer at that time. I was like, man, is there anything? Do you have anything in San Diego? And he's like, you know what? There's an opportunity for you here in San Diego. It's a special duty. And I'm like, really? Tell me all about it. And he said, oh, the SEER schoolhouse. So SEER stands for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. So it's a, I'm not sure if you heard of that a schoolhouse. The special forces. Yeah, training. absolutely. So there was an opportunity there to be a senior enlisted advisor, which is equivalent to like a command master chief job. I was like, oh man, sign me up. I'm all about it. Let's do it. Let's work it. What do we have to do to get it done? He goes, oh, no worries. So he, the, that detailer talked to the special detailer that was in charge of that program. I was like, cool. Everything's working out. They work together. They both sent me an email, said, hey, you're good to go, Master Ramos. You're, you're going to be going to the schoolhouse over there as the senior enlisted advisor. 
I'm like, I'm happy. I'm <laughs> elated. I'm, I feel great. And then um, even the master chief that was over there, I mean, I can literally see it from my patio, that duty station. He reached out to me and he's like, hey, man, I, um, I heard you're coming this way. I was like, <laughs> hey, man, come over. Let's have lunch. You know, I want you to meet the staff. Uh, he said, I reached out to the command master chief because their primary um, duty station was in Florida. I reached out to him. He said, he's all about you coming over here. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So I'm all excited. I'm, you know, I'm, I didn't tell too many people. I told a couple. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to stay in San Diego. I'm excited. You know, I'm going on my shore duty. I'm going to be close to my kids, which is the biggest, you know, reward. I'm going to finish school because I haven't even finished my degree, you know, uh, and then I'm going to recharge. You're referring to your college degree. Yes. Yes. My college degree. And then I'm going to recharge and then I'm going to do, that'll take me to 27 years after those three day, three years on shore duty. And I'm going to do my last three on the ship and pay it forward on the ship. And that's my 30 years. That was my plan. And then I got a phone call from the detailer and he's like, Hey man, uh, sorry to tell you uh, that that Sierra schoolhouse billet, that job is a no go. It's not going to happen. And I was like, why what's going on and he told me something that didn't make sense to me um but uh i know he was being very helpful the detail helped me out a lot and he's being very helpful but he told me that another department said so and so they said whatever they said so i fought tooth and nail to figure out who was in that department and who was making these decisions or you know so on and so forth because to me it didn't make sense the job was there for the taking the job was available i'm not asking them to create a job for me i'm like they told me i was good to go and that i'm going and what's the problem um well anyhow i tried i fought tooth and nail to try to get a hold of that department um and i got that person's point of contact no answer crickets so i was like okay that's the kind of treatment a mass chief of 20 plus years gets now their headquarters is like uh tennessee state of tennessee so and then i reached out to another one who's actually a fellow master chief who also works over there crickets so at this time my blood was boiling like <laughs> i'm like this is not cool man. like if, if a mass chief of 20 plus years can't get an answer at least an answer what about our junior sailors? So I wasn't happy about that. And I'm not slamming the Navy for one second. I'm slamming the people who are not okay, uh, not right. But anyhow, I love the Navy, and the Navy's done so much for me. But anyhow, I don't want to get off track. And um, so uh, after knocking on doors, no one would let me in, and someone put a bug in my ear and said, hey, um, there's a survey um, that you can fill out, and you can actually make some comments, and that survey is read by the Admiral here in Tennessee. I'm like, awesome. Let me take that survey. <laughs> I'll take that survey, you know, and I, I took that survey uh, respectfully, right? And I wrote this long, I poured my heart out. It was a letter that I wrote. And I basically said, hey, I understand the needs of the Navy. I understand all of that. You know, I'm, you know, I've served on three ships back to back. I'm trying to be here in San Diego. I've never asked for anything. The billet is there for the taking. I'm not asking you to create a billet. The, the, the billet is there. Please sign me up. I've already done acting command master chiefs on an aircraft carrier. I've done acting command master chief on a, a LHD, on which I was on a COVID deployment. Um, like I've I've been there, done that. I can do it. I can do the job blindfolded. Sign me up. I said all these things, and I did point out uh, that you know I was kind of upset that I'm reaching out and no one's responding. I don't believe in that. Like if I send you an email or if I call, like I believe that you should respond. <laughs> At a minimum, at least tell me, hey, no, I, tell me something. Not, Don't respond at all. So I kind of voiced that in there. Well, anyhow, a couple of weeks passed, and the email came into my inbox. And I'm excited. I'm like, oh, yeah, I made it to the admiral. You know, the staff, I looked at the email, and it had the admiral on there and had all their staff, all the civilian high big dogs in the, in the email. It had a captain, a couple other people there, even the master chief that I called out. And... um. I looked at the email and I remember reading that email on my desk on the ship and my jaw dropped because in my mind, I looked at that email. I was like, did they even read what I had to say in this letter? Because basically what, of course the Admiral couldn't address me, you know, Hey, he, you know, the Admiral, whatever, he's too good to talk to me. Right. So, you know, he sent his captain to talk to me. So his captain says, Hey, master chief in a nutshell, he says, master chief, well, you need to go to Washington state. If you don't go to Washington state, Hey, feel free to, to check out of the Navy, basically retire. And I was just like, you know, like my jaw dropped and I waited a couple of days before I responded to anything. Cause I was heated. I was really upset. I felt really down. I felt, 
I felt betrayed, all of the above, all those emotions. And I was very angry and, um, time passed. And then next thing you know, the orders come in, uh, to the ship and it says, Oh, Hey, welcome to Whidbey Island, Washington, blah, blah, so, so on and so forth. But anyways, I responded back and I said, okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And then uh, I'm going to find my way out the Navy. So then I submitted my paperwork to retire and, um, and it was like a last minute retire. Everything was so, so compressed. The timeline to retire was so compressed and there were so many things going on and I wasn't really prepared for it mentally or, or physically, none of the above. But anyhow, I, and that was another thing that built up my anxiety because if that paperwork came back and they didn't approve my retirement, oh my gosh, I don't know what would have happened. Like, so I, they could actually deny your retirement? They could actually deny your request for retirement. And so that was one of my biggest worries. I was like, man, if they deny it, I'm going to really lose my top and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so thank goodness they ended up um, approving it and then it was time to retire. That was a whole different world. And what really, really burned me even more was that job, that Sears schoolhouse job, the senior enlisted billet, it's still gapped, which means it's still vacant. vacant. That job at Whidbey Island that they wanted to send me to, it's still vacant. So- those jobs are still open, vacant, and they lost a mass chief that could have gave six more years to the Navy. Like, I have six more years in me. I could have for sure paid it forward for six more years. And again, the I just I was just asking to have a little bit of empathy. And I think that's one thing they lost, that group lost. You know, I don't know if, I'm sure, you know, they, they advised the admiral or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's that admiral's job to make that right call. And I don't believe they made that right call. And, and, and that's, that's the way I ended up, um, kidding out the Navy. And like I said, it was a, a compressed timeline. So I was, I got out, I found out I was getting out the Navy in October of last year. Um, I was to get out of the Navy March 31st. So from October to March 31st, I was running ragged. Like I had major surgery. I had had to set up all my medical appointments. I had to figure out life. Like there's so many things going on. Retirement is one of the most stressful parts of my whole career. Like it really was. And um, now I feel like I'm, I'm doing a lot better, but it, it was a rough go. And I was upset at the whole situation, but um, I took a deep breath and I'm just, again, I go back to everything in life happens for a reason. You know, and everything just started falling into place. Thank goodness after that. After all that stuff, all the, the retirement stress and all that, everything started falling into place. My book was released. Good things started to happen, and now I feel good. I feel free. Thank goodness. Well, let's go into something more positive, your book. Yes. So when did the idea come to start writing a book? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Yes. Um, so over the years, I've been told to, to write a book, um, especially uh, by those who I serve with because you know, a lot of them knew my background and they're like, there's no way you were in a gang. Like, cause to me, I, I'm a genuine guy and I'm straight up and I'm cool. I'm, I'm cool with everybody. And, uh, you know, and they're like, there's no way you're in a gang. You should write a book, man, write a story. And I got that by so many people. And then when I was on deployment, my last deployment, 2021, uh, the COVID deployment, I was like, you know what? I'm going to jump on this computer and do some research and see what it takes. So that's when I got the idea. And then I got on the computer. And what year was that? Uh, this was 2021, last okay. year. Yes. So I got on the computer and I started jumping into blogs. I started just reading up, hey, how do I publish a book? Self-publishing companies. I just started diving deep into it. And I was like, man, I was really shocked and surprised on how easy it is to get a book out into the world. I was like, I'm going to do it. And I'm the type of guy, when I say I'm going to do something, uh, man, I, man, I am relentless. Like, I, I want results, so I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to, I'm going to suffocate that goal until it happens. You know what I mean? Um, so while I was doing that, all that research, um, I reached out, I was just doing some research and I looked up, um, I looked up authors and, uh, this lady named, uh, Lorraine Copcroft came up and I read her resume and I was like, wow, I was impressed with her resume. She was an author, a ghost writer and a whole bunch of other things. And, and uh, she also lived in uh, Manhattan Beach, California. So that kind of, oh, well, she's in California. She lives in Australia now. But um, I reached out to her. I shot her a message on Facebook Messenger. I'm like, hey, uh, my name is Raul Ramos, Master Chief in the Navy. Um, and I'm thinking about writing a story. And this is my story in a nutshell. What do you think? Do you think it's worth getting out into the world? And to my surprise, she responded. And I didn't think she would respond. And she responded. And she goes, you know what? The world needs a feel-good story right now. 
you know, it's COVID. The world is crazy. She goes, get it out there. I was like, all right, great. Thanks. Where do I start? <laughs> so, but after that, she just flooded my inbox with so many pointers, man. So many great things. And you know, She became my mentor in the book writing game, you know, so she was a blessing in the sky, man. And, and that's how it all started It started from that. And then I started building my social media platforms and started hy- hyping it up and then asking for questions and advice from, you know, my friends and family on Facebook and all the social media platforms and all that came together, man. And, and, you know, all those pieces came together and formed one big puzzle. And it was, it's been great so far. When you sat down to actually write, did it come easy for you to, cause you're very open in your growing up story, your time in the Navy, you don't try to sugarcoat it. You don't try to hide behind anything negative or bad that you did. Yes. Did you find it easy to be open and honest like that? Uh, for me, I, I, it was very easy for me. You know, um, I mentioned it in my book, it took me about two weeks to write my story. You know, before I gave it to the editor, my great friend who basically made it perfect the way I wanted it, you know, but yeah, it was easy for me. And it, it was kind of like therapy for me as well, because as I was writing it, I was like, man, like it really, it really hit a couple nerves, man. I felt it on my chest and, you know, it, uh, and I, there were some things that I just, I needed to get off and I got it off by, by writing about it, you know? So it was great. Yeah. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't difficult. It felt great to write it, man. Now you self-published it. Yes. Uh, so I used a self-publishing company, which is great, man. They're a great company, uh, book baby. I, there were another piece of that puzzle that I was talking about. They're, they're awesome. So they, they'll take a writer and turn them into an author. You know, I don't claim to be some great writer or anything. The writing experience that I have, I learned all of that in the Navy. And some schooling that I did along the ways, but I'm not, I just told my story, you know, and I was blessed to have a mentor uh, in the book writing game and my editor, who was my shipmate, she served with me and she was a blessing in the sky. She's a genius, man. And she's a perfectionist and, and she's a genius. So she, she helped edit that book and make it like perfect. And I'll never forget the first outline she sent me when I gave her my manuscript. I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I want. I was blown away, man. And I was just a blessing, you know, and then the self-publishing company, they're amazing too. Like all those pieces just fell into place, man. Uh, but I, you know, I had that will, the desire, and then I took action, you know, and, and it made it happen, man. And here we are. Thank goodness. My book is doing pretty good and it's opening a lot of doors, you know, and it's helping me get into uh, youth programs and then talking to youth and all these good things are coming from this book, man. Total blessing. So for somebody who's got an idea to write a book, what hurdles or what issues did you have to overcome that, you know, kind of be that voice of advice? Like, Hey, don't do this or make sure you do this. Yes. Um, what I would say is what I would say to anyone who wants to write a book. Um, my word, I have a couple of things that I would like to say to them. The first is you know what? Just get to writing whatever you want to write about. Don't worry about the grammar. Don't worry about the misspells. Whatever story you want to write, if it's about yourself or whatever, just get to writing. Whether it's on me personally, I went old school, right? I did both my phone and I did my, you know, pen and paper. And then it ended up on a Word document. But just get to writing whatever you want to write about. Um, and then I would say is start jumping into the internet is your friend. Google is your friend. <laughs> the internet has so many resources. It's amazing. Get online. You can literally go onto Google and write, how do I self-publish a book or self-publishing companies or whatever the case be and dive deep into those blogs because you got all these authors or or people wanting to be authors or books or just all this information and take it all in and try your best to find a mentor in the book game. Someone who's been there, done that. Um, I would also tell them to establish um, uh, social media platforms because that helps you spread the word. Like me, my goal was to spread the word about my story, my book. I want to impact lives. You may, your motivation may be different. You may want to sell a whole bunch of books. So you might want to go a different avenue, but anyways, um, do that. Uh, platforms, the social media platforms are so helpful. Uh, book covers, your book cover better be on point because that obviously that's, what's gonna, that's, what's gonna attract people. Um, that book cover, how it, how it came to, man, it's, it's awesome. And I love it, but, um, they definitely need to think about a book cover and what, how are you going to sell? How are you going to, when someone walks into a bookstore or target or wherever, and they look at that bookshelf, you want them to be like, oh man, I want to open this book and see what's inside. So that book cover is going to be crucial. And I got help along the way with that. I got some ideas from my friends on social media platform that helped me come up with this, with this book cover. So those are some things that I would say. 
uh, well, to help them. And, and that leads into my next question. There's two parts to it. One, I want to hit on the artistic side of it. But my first question is, how long did it take to come up with the, the title? Oh, it didn't take long at all, man. So I used social media, right? Uh, so I was already telling uh, my Facebook friends, like, hey, I'm thinking about writing a book. Um, th- this, is what I, well, this is what my story is going to entail, blah, blah, blah. And then I said, what do, you think I, what do you think about a title? So then all the comments just started flooding away, man. Just some, you know, some were clowning, some were being funny, and then some were really good. I was like, oh, man, that's a good title. And then one of my buddies, he's actually a retired chief now, and he, on a comment, he wrote, hey, let's, why not from, he said, ese to jefe. You know, you were an ese, and, and now you're a chief. You know, even though you're a master chief, you were all considered chiefs. Right. I was like, man, that sounds really cool, man. And I was like, okay. And then I just, I, I picked that one out of all the comments. And I was like, okay, now I'm going to just do SA to Master Hefe, which is Master Chief is what I made in the Navy. And I was like, let's do it. And then it just stuck. It just stuck with it, man. So here's, the, here's where we throw yourself under the bus. What <laughs> silly names did you come up with that you're glad you didn't go with? Oh my gosh. I can't even remember, man. I'm going to be honest with you. There were so many. <laughs> There were so many, but there were some, there were clowning. There was a whole bunch of stuff just clowning me, but uh, I, that one definitely stuck with me, man. So <laughs> going to the, to the artistic side, and I want to go back into the book for this story. Yes. You talk about in the book how you were actually, uh, whether you call it a tag or graffiti, but there's a, there's a wall in your old hood where you've got Florin, Florencia spray painted on there. Yes. For somebody who's never seen it, give me an idea how big the letters are. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so on uh, the street that uh, where I, when I first joined the hood, there was a big warehouse and that warehouse had a long, a long wall that stretched uh, east and west. Lengthwise, I'd say that wall is easily about, a, I'd say about 100, about 100 feet maybe. And then height wise, uh, easily 25, 30 feet. So that's how big the block letters were. And you did that? It's your work. Oh, that one is not my oh, work. Oh, okay. That okay. one is not my work. No, but that's the homeboy's work. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so I, then I misread the book. I yes. thought you actually did that. But I was, what I was going to point I was going to ask is, did you have an artistic side to you growing up? Were you into drawing and that type stuff? Oh, thanks for asking. Yeah. You know what? I For a little while. So when I was in school, in elementary school, as I started to drift away from the good, uh, the good role, uh, what I would do in class is I would my piece of paper, I would turn it over and I would start drawing. I wasn't a very good, I would draw like cartoon characters here and there. And then as, as time passed, then I started doing lettering and, you know, so, you know, I called myself a wannabe gangster back then too, cause I <laughs> wanted to be part of the gang and I saw them in school and they were more active. And then I started writing like graffiti style letters and, you know, and that's what I would do in class. I would just turn the paper over and then I started getting good at it. And I was like, dang, um, and, you know, and, and I'm not trying to glorify anything or brag about this, but in the hood, in the gang, like I was, I was the guy for graffiti because my, my style of writing was just, it was good. You know, in the hood, it was like, dang, like, you know, he, he gets down on that, on that style of writing. Cause you did almost get arrested for tagging at one point in time. I, actually, I did get arrested for tagging at one point at time. Um, and I went to jail for that. Any length of time? Uh, so I, I can tell you about that. If you want to talk about, it, I'll tell you all about it. Sure. Yes. Um, so it was my best friend's birthday, uh, and him and I decided. And before I get into that, uh, I want to say first of all, I'm embarrassed to say what I did because it's not cool. I, I, now that I know the big picture is like, hey, you know that was a business that I that I vandalized, right? This is somebody who runs a business who worked hard to have their business. And here I was tagging on their damn wall. And I would, I didn't think about that when I was young, but now that I'm older, I think about it, right? Like, holy crap, they had to take their time and their money to paint, to paint over that graffiti. And I feel terrible. I wish I could find that family and go pay it forward. Like, Hey, I'll, I'll pay you whatever you had. You know, I wish I can do that. And that liquor store is still there. So there's a famous liquor store right on Florence Avenue and Hooper Avenue and Hooper Avenue. We used to call it killer Hooper. And that's another story. But anyhow, and me and my best friend decided that I wanted to write on that wall, big graffiti letters on that wall that night on his birthday. 
And, you know, he was supposedly watching out for me. I was 16 years old at the supposedly time. Supposedly <laughs> watching out for me. <laughs> yes. Uh, him and another homeboy I had, Spike. Um, and uh, I was 16 years old. And um, I had a spray can. So I walk up to, to the wall. It's a big wall, huge wall. It ran across uh, across the street, uh, north and uh, north and south. And it was probably the same size wall as that warehouse we just talked about. And I... I Big old letters, you know, I was one who always would try to jump up and get the biggest letters on there. And then LAPD comes rolling up. No, I'm sorry. LA County Sheriff comes rolling up behind me. Um, and, and right away they told me, hey, man, uh, no, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyhow, a little scuffle happened there real quick and they cuffed me and uh, they took me to that new jail in Linwood. So the the. Century? Century yeah. detention facility? Yes, exactly. I think it's a women's jail now, right? I believe so. Yes. So so first the cop asked me, hey, how old are you, man? I was like, I'm 16. He goes, bullshit, you're not 16. I always looked older at my age. You're not You're not 16. He's like, bullshit. And um, I was like, yeah. And um, so before that, I've never been arrested, never had a record or anything. And I was a gangbanger. I was trying to act tough and all this stuff. I literally you know, wrote graffiti on someone's wall, so they took me to jail. And they took me to that facility in Linwood. Thinking you were an adult. Thinking I was an adult. Because that's had not no, Juvie Hall. Exactly. I didn't have any ID. I didn't have anything. I didn't have a previous record. Right? And there was no one to prove that I was 16 years old. <laughs> uh, and so, yes, yeah, so I was there for a few days. And um, one of the deputies that was um, that was there, he called me over. He's like, hey, how old are you, man? I'm like, hey, I'm 16. And he laughs at me. He asked me, what are you here for? I was like, oh, I'll strike up on the wall. That's what we would say. We would strike up on the wall. And he goes, and he laughed. And then he, I guess he talked to someone. They came and grabbed me. And then they took me to a back room. And they sat me in the room. I was in that room for like three, almost four hours, just sitting there. I was like, oh. and I guess um, they found a way to get a hold of my mother um, through my best friend. And um, my mother came with my birth certificate <laughs> <laughs> and, and got me out of there. Yeah, she got me out of there, and um, I, I went home. Then I had a court date to attend, so my mom and I went to the court, and then I was told by the judge that I was going to go to jail for 120 days. And, like, they're ready to cuff me there in the courtroom, ready to take me to the back, and I was going to go to L.A. County Jail. And I was like, let's go. I'm ready. Like, I wanted to earn my stripes in the county. Like, I was young. I was 16. I was like, let's do it. And my mom jumps up in the crowd and she's like, no, in Spanish, no, no, hagas eso, no hagan eso. don't do that. Don't do that. He's 16 years old. You can't take him. Like she literally like, and everyone's like, what the hell is going on? And the judge is like, what? And she had the birth certificate again, showed it to him again. And they're like, all right. And then uh, they sent me to a probation officer and I was on probation for a little while. And that was that. Did that ever impact you getting into the military? Oh, no. Oh, at the time. Because no. you were a juvie? Yeah, I was a juvie and it wasn't a felony. So you know, they didn't, they didn't sweat it. So you, you hit on the fact that looking back on it, it was vandalism. Yes, absolutely. You ruined somebody's business that they had to yes. pay to, to paint over. Yes. But is there a little bit of you and that looks back on that with a little bit of nostalgia when you drive through that neighborhood and you see something, if your work is gone, but when yeah. you see like that giant mural, is it art to you? Uh, to me, it's art. I'm going to say it's art. And um, and what's crazy is, like I said, I was one of the guys that was like, I, I was standing out in the hood as as because of my style of writing. And I see, I still see that style of writing to this day. If I drive through and I look at the wall and it's in Florence, it's the same style of writing. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, they kept it going. Um, but then I look at the bigger picture and I was like, that's not cool. You know, that's not cool. And that's what I want to instill in the youngsters. It's like, hey, you know, you think it's cool to strike up on this wall, but now let's flip the coin, right? What if it was your business or your mom's business and some gangbanger came up here and stroke up on that wall and then you had to come out your pocket and your time to paint over that wall? How would you feel? And be honest with me, be 100. And their response is going to probably be, damn, that is messed up, you know, or they have too much pride and I'm not going to say it, but <laughs> it's the truth though. So now that I've grown and I'm more mature, and I can see the big picture. I see the other side of the coin. But yes, when I do walk, and I'm like, wow, okay, that's cool. They kept it going. They kept that style going. Now, for your kids, have you ever taken them back to your old hood? So my son, I drove through there with him a couple times, but I ne I would never stop because it's just it's too dangerous there, right? There's there's so much going on there. I mean, to this day, there's a lot going on. Uh, so I wouldn't stop there. But um, my daughter, I've never drove her through there. But my son and I, we kind of drove through there one time. He's like, damn, dad, like this is. 
you know, this is uh, scary, <laughs> you know. Um, but he got an idea, you know, and uh, he wants no part of it. Thank goodness, you know. So talking about your transition, you, you talked about you had face tattoos when you went in. Yes. But you've since gotten them removed. What, what caused that decision so late into your career? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, so in 2015, uh, I was a chief already. I, I was promoted to E7. And um, I, I guess there was a lot of reasons why I decided to re remove the tattoos. For one, I was like, okay, hey, I'm in a profession now. I'm a professional. I am a Navy chief, right? I am a mentor. Um, and, and oh, by the way, if someday someone's going to someone's going to do something bad or someone's going to want to retaliate or someone's going to recognize me. I could care less about me, but the people around me is what I'm worried about. Right. I think I got, I got like, Hey, wake up, man. Like you're too grown for this. You're professional. Now that's all behind you. Now, like you're putting your kids in danger. You're putting your, your service members in danger. You're putting a lot of people in danger. And oh, and oh, by the way, you're a Navy chief. Now, like you got to set that example. And that was my mentality. Um, like I got to I got to look, I got to look the part. Um, and I knew deep down that even though those face tattoos were removed, that I will never forget where I came from because where I came from the hood is what made, that was a part of making me the man that I am today. Uh, but, um, and I decided to remove them and I got them lasered off. And boy, let me tell you that laser, <laughs> I could literally smell the flesh burning off my face. And anyone who's done it will tell you the same thing. It is no joke. Like it hurt. Um, but they did a pretty good job. I, like the one under my eye is completely gone. The one on my sideburns, you can't even see them anymore. If I do shave my sideburn on my right side, you can see a slight ink, but it, they're gone. But you never got any direct pressure while you were active to get them removed? No. You know what? No one's ever. I would always just be looked at funny or people would wonder or they, you know, a lot of times I got, is that a scar? You know, because again, my sideburn, my hair would grow a little bit longer, but you can see the ink. And you can see some of the lettering, but they're like, is that, what is that? Is that, why do you have block on your side? Is that, and people would make, some people would be joking and some people were serious. Did you get those tattoos there to mark where your sideburns are supposed to be? Like, you know, cause we're. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly what I did. I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, so I had to bite my tongue on those all the time. Like, man, I felt like, you know, I mean, never mind. <laughs> but yeah. So going forward for you, you talk about it a little bit in the book. What do you, what's going to be your future for you? Uh, thanks. Thanks for asking that, Paul. So um, school for one, uh, you know, one of my goals is to finish my degree. I didn't take full advantage of that while being in the service uh, and I'm making no excuses. I could have completed a degree while in the service, even though my job was, you know, very intense and, and, and kept me really busy and going away in deployment or whatnot. Um, so one of my goals is to finish a degree in business. I'm, I'm exploring that now. It's a lot of fun. Um, and then after school, we'll see where life takes me. Uh, while I'm doing school, I'm getting involved in um, mentoring. Uh, so I signed up to be a mentor uh, for a program called Prison. Uh, uh, Hope for Prisoners. Hope for Prisoners, sorry. Yes, Hope for Prisoners out of, their, out of Nevada. And uh, so I'm excited to see where that goes. And then I also uh, met this fine gentleman who's a um, retired uh, Marine Corps vet. And uh, he works for the L.A. County Probation Office, and he got me into a juvenile camp where, you know, juveniles are incarcerated, and I get to go see them next week. So I'm excited about that to share my story to, in hopes to give them some hope and some inspiration and to let them know that I'm living proof that change is possible, that success is possible, and I hope to continue to do that. Um, and then uh, after all that, and we'll see where life takes me. We'll see where life takes me. I don't, I hope not to work ever again, <laughs> but who knows, I might get bored and, and, you know, I might have to, to pick something up, but uh, I don't have my mind set on one profession as of yet. But giving back to kids or people who came from your former life is kind of one of the things that drives you. Oh, absolutely. Yes, for sure. 110% I want to give back. I really, you know, even, even if I change one life or get one of those, one of those kids, one of those youth or adult, whoever it is, if I can get that one person to say, you know what? And there is more to life than gangs or drugs or, or whatnot. And if he can do it, so can I. And if, if 
if it's one and I may not even see that change, but maybe later on down the line, they change. You know, I just want to be, I want to plant that seed. Like all those other people are doing like law enforcement and doing like the counselors are doing. I want to be able to plant that seed and, and you know, they can relate to them and to me and I can relate to them because I've been there, done that. And I was in their shoes as well. Um, so I'm a better person, right? So I'm blessed to be able to do that. And I want to do that. I want to continue to do that as long as I can. You got any ideas for another book? You know what? I thought about that as well. I, re- <laughs> I really did. Um, so Joni, uh, she's the book editor and um, we talked about co-authoring a couple books and we'll see. We'll see maybe when the dust settles a little bit. Uh, still got a lot of things going on right now post-retirement. Uh, but when the dust settles, uh, we're going to revisit that and see what we do. Yes. So if anybody's got specific questions for you, how can they get a hold of you? Oh, thanks. Yes. Um, they can email me. Uh, so they can email me at uh, triple R. So it's R-R-R-A-M-O-S the letter X number three at gmail.com. And you can reach me at almost any um, uh, social media platform. And I didn't ask you this before. I want to ask you real quick. Is there a plan to do an audio version of your book? Yes. So that's, that's the plan. Um, so an audio version uh, is takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money. Are you going to be the voice or are you going to and, be- and yes, I would like to be the voice. So, um, and that's why it's taking a little bit longer. Cause like I said, I have a lot going on and uh, I don't want to um, bite off more than I can chew right now. I just, I don't want to fill the plate up too much, but it's coming down the line. Uh, I've got a lot of requests for that. And I also got a lot of requests to uh, make it into a Spanish version which also takes a lot of time and money. So, uh, but it'll get there eventually. And where's the best place to find the book? Uh, the best place in the easiest place. I think uh, everyone is using Amazon. You know, it's so convenient. Everyone's already hooked up to Amazon. It's, it's, it's a click away. Get on Amazon and order it. You can find it in ebook and also uh, in, in paperback for now and hopefully hard copy down the line. I appreciate your time, sir. Oh, thank you, Paul. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you watching, but before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also, any comments are appreciated. Thank you.